Hello and welcome back. In the previous podcast, we explored recognition of psychiatric symptoms and making psychiatric diagnoses in adults with an intellectual disability. In this podcast, we'll discuss how to decide if, when, and what medications to prescribe after formulating a diagnosis. It's important to remember that responsible psychotropic prescribing also means considering the option of not prescribing at all. There are many mental health conditions that people with intellectual disability experience where medication is not the first line treatment. Psychological rather than pharmaceutical treatment should be considered first for people with intellectual disability for conditions such as cases of mild anxiety and depressive disorders, isolated panic attacks and simple phobias, mild to moderate depression, especially if there has been a clear environmental trigger, rituals associated with obsessive compulsive disorder, aggression associated with depression, anger management, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, substance use disorders, personality disorders, trauma. Associated issues of loss, trauma and stigma are common to many people with an intellectual disability. Reasonable adjustments may need to be made to many of these therapies. However, a small and expanding evidence base does suggest that psychological therapies can be used effectively in people with intellectual disability. Further information on psychological therapies and adaptations for people with intellectual disability can be found in the Psychological Therapies and People Who Have Intellectual Disabilities by the British Psychological Society. It's appropriate to consider prescribing psychotropic medications if the person with intellectual disability has a diagnosed mental illness and has failed to respond to psychological therapies where these were indicated as first line. Psychotropic medications may also be appropriate in cases of moderate or severe anxiety disorders, complex anxiety disorders, for example, comorbid anxiety with psychosis, severe depression, situations of acute mania or bipolar depression, and psychosis. In complex cases where mental illness is suspected but difficult to determine, a medication trial may sometimes be considered. Prescribing for challenging behaviour in the absence of a mental illness should only be considered if behaviours are severe in nature and maximal non-pharmacotherapy has already been trialled unsuccessfully. In both these circumstances, a psychiatrist's advice should be sought before proceeding. Dr. Bruce Chenoweth will now describe the different treatment options he chose and the rationale behind these treatment choices. Well, uh, I'd now like to introduce you to Claude. Claude on presentation was a 44-year-old autistic man with moderate intellectual disability. He was obese as well. He weighed 115 kilograms. He was episodically violent, particularly to his mother, and when frustrated, he would injure himself, particularly by banging his head on the wall and biting himself. And there was remorseless, relentless verbal pressure that came out as a symptom of his extremely high arousal and anxiety. And there'd been a recent decline overall in his functional capacity and self-care. So sorting through the history, his mum's pregnancy was marked by hyperemesis and severe influenza. It was a full-time normal delivery with a good APGAR score, but then milestones were slow. A cleft pellet was repaired and diagnosis of autism at the age of two, no cause found. He was a generally healthy man, but a somewhat lengthened face, some asthma and some shortness of breath on, on uh, exercise. He was mildly dysmorphic on examination, relentless high-pitched vocalising, auditory and other sensory hyperacusis. He had many autistic features. He was hyperkinetic, high anxiety, depressed, and certainly very paranoid. He took offense at absolutely everything. So proceeding in a multidisciplinary con context, uh, a full medical uh, review was conducted by the GP, utilizing the CHAP tool, that's the Comprehensive Health Assessment Protocol, 
The genetics review confirmed a 22Q11 deletion. This is the velocardiofacial syndrome about more we will speak as we go along. The sensory profile by an occupational therapist confirmed auditory hypersensitivity with Claude favoring visual and kinesthetic input over uh, speech and, um, and sound. A functional analysis uh, of behavior by a psychologist identified other triggers to his, uh, for his behavior. We had a social worker look at the family support needs, the workplace was consulted, and a multi-agency meeting was convened to define who was going to do what and when and who was responsible for each part. Next, the uh, obesity uh, called for a dietetic review, which was duly done, and the early signs of a metabolic syndrome um, required him to be sent to a, an endocrinologist who uh, reviewed uh, uh, his um, uh, insulin uh, status. So, looking for a psychiatric diagnosis, there was a family history of psychosis and depression, Probable, he probably he was presenting with an early psychosis. He was sleepless with daily mood variation. Predictably, uh, he was um, worst in the morning, picking up as the day wore on. He was obese and anxious and appeared clinically depressed. There was this decline in functional capacity. He was irritable and angry, and as said before, he took offense easily. And we need to remember that the 22Q11 deletion predisposes to psychosis. There is a predictable behavioral phenotype uh, which includes autistic qualities, oppositionality and irritability. And 30% will develop schizophrenia. So I find that Maslow is, is, is quite helpful here. Uh, the hierarchy of needs at the base of the pyramid is basic security, followed by health and medical uh, attention, then mental health, then perhaps behavioral modification. And finally, at the pointy end of the pyramid, we'll be looking at targeted medication, specifically aimed, hopefully, given our limited understandings, at the neural pathways involved. So what did we do for him? Well, we prioritised interventions, ensured physical health was uh, uh, maintained, managed the obesity, and uh, looked for psychotropic uh, medication that would not compromise his cardiometabolic status. That's a problem. And assess which one of these multiplicity of problems we would target and in what order. We addressed the medical issues, Dietitian, OT and speech pathologist. Endocrinologist commenced uh, metformin uh, for the metabolic aspects of his uh, presentation. Regular examinations by the GP. The case manager from the uh, 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 Family and Community Services provided psychology, functional assessment of behaviour and extended family support. Mother's depression was treated and adequate support provided for her and psychiatric management and was followed up at the mental health clinic. Claude was started on low dose risperidone which addressed the possible psychosis as well as assisting in his auditory processing. We started fluoxetine for the anxiety, depression and we started propranolol uh, to assist with the peripheral uh, autonomic feedback loop with respect to his uh, uh, autonomic arousal. Reflecting on the cardiometabolic status, um, risperidone and all the, of the other uh, dopamine blockers enhance uh, prolactin, which increases appetite. Insulin resistance is increased. Decreased leptin also increases appetite. There's an increase in the hormone ghrelin, uh, which increases fat deposition. And obesity itself generates adiponectin, a hormone which increases insulin resistance. So this is a dilemma. Do we treat the psychosis and other related phenomena with a, um, a dopamine blocker and attempt to manage the cardiometabolic status uh, 
uh, separately, and in fact that's what we tried to do. At three months, Claude's behaviour had improved. Anxiety and depression were less on clinical evaluation. Attention to sensory issues had led to a change in environment and more informed communication. Obesity was no better, and the risperidone was changed to aripiprazole. Finally, points to ponder. Intellectual disability is not just a deficit state to be managed through education, communication, enhancement, and environmental engineering and behaviour management. There is often quite profound disruption of neural structure and function, which may be helped if these processes are more, uh, better understood. Behavioural phenotyping can illuminate management and prognosis. Medicating should be part of a comprehensive, multidisciplinary management strategy. And all medication should have specific target goals, not just shooting from the hip as uh, given for, for behaviour. Finally, um, Claude demonstrates the extreme complexity of management of some of these patients who present. And it, it, picking our way through this minefield of complexity uh, it does indeed require um, many disciplines and strategies. Thank you. Once you are confident that a psychotropic agent is warranted, there are a number of issues to consider when selecting a particular drug. These include current best practice guidelines, for example, for moderate to severe depression in people with an intellectual disability, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are the first line psychotropic treatment choice. Preferences of the individual with intellectual disability and or, where relevant, their carers. Past psychotropic medication trials, including the degree to which particular medications were found to be helpful and any side effects that occurred for that person and any other comorbidities. Compared to the general population, people with an intellectual disability are more likely to have comorbid physical conditions that may affect their response to medication. It's therefore very important to consider any comorbid conditions before deciding on which drug to prescribe. For example, in patients with epilepsy, Caution needs to be exercised when prescribing medications that lower the seizure threshold. This includes atypical antipsychotic agents such as clozapine and olanzapine and some typical antipsychotics. Many patients with an intellectual disability also experience dysphagia or other swallowing and feeding difficulties. Medications including sedatives, antipsychotics, anticonvulsants can all impact on neuromotor swallowing control and should therefore be prescribed with caution, and only if deemed completely necessary. Due to a combination of genetic and lifestyle factors, people with an intellectual disability are also at increased risk for a number of cardiometabolic disturbances, such as glucose dysregulation and hyperlipidemia. Where possible, consideration should be given to prescribing psychotropics with a lower cardiometabolic risk profile in these patients. In patients with co-occurring intellectual disability and dementia, medications associated with excess sedation or anticholinergic effects may exacerbate cognitive function. Caution should also be exercised prescribing psychotropics that slow down gastrointestinal motility in patients with chronic constipation. For information specific to monitoring cardiometabolic risk factors in people with an intellectual disability, including resources to give to your patients and their carers, visit the 3DN website. It is also important to consider formulation type when prescribing to people with an intellectual disability. Depot medication should generally be avoided, for example, as there is some evidence that people with an intellectual disability may be more prone to side effects such as tardive dyskinesia. In people with swallowing difficulties, alternative forms may also need to be considered. The person's willingness to comply with monitoring requirements must also be accounted for when selecting a drug. Don't prescribe medications with a narrow therapeutic index such as lithium or stringent monitoring requirements such as clozapine to patients who are likely to refuse blood tests or other investigations. A graded exposure program, for example seeing the University of Queensland link, may assist the individuals to overcome a fear of blood tests.
In some cases, the use of a mild sedating agent, such as a small dose of diazepam, may decrease anxiety sufficiently to make the person agreeable to venipuncture. In this podcast, we've reviewed some basic considerations when deciding if, when, and what psychotropic agent to prescribe. In the following podcast, we'll discuss issues relating to instituting, monitoring, and discontinuing medication in people with an intellectual disability.